<laughs> Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us again for Music and Coffee with Lady V and the Ivers Academy. Today, we've got some really great guests for you all to um, listen to. Um, we've got Gary Clark. Hello, Gary, up in Dundee. You are in Dundee, aren't you, Gary? I am in Dundee. David Arnold. Hello. Hello. No, in the corridor next to the toilet. I'm in the corridor next to the toilet. Yeah, my normal environment. I think Olga's still muted. Oh, no, not yeah. anymore. Olga, you, are you in London as well? I am. I'm in sunny Streatham. Ah, oh. so yeah. um, Olga, you, I mean, gosh, you've been doing some amazing things from um, working with bands like Coldplay and you're working on The Crown, the TV show right now, I believe. And David, yeah. obviously, you've done like, oh my gosh, like your list, I could take an hour probably listing everything you've done from Bjork, um, the song, that song I love, and um, obviously the James Bond, and you've done Good Omens, which obviously I watched and was a big fan of, and Sherlock. And then Gary, you were in Mary's Prayer, uh, sorry, the song Mary's Prayer, Danny Wilson. And then you also now turned your hand to doing musicals um, and TV sh shows and films like Sing Street. Mm. So I think something that's really interesting here between all of you is the fact that where did we start and did we plan to be doing all these different things or did you have one route originally? Like, um, did you plan to be just band members and you know, like be the Rolling Stones forever or, or not? Gary, what was what was your situation? Um, I, I didn't really. I kind of was always quite open to the idea of doing loads of different things. And I quite fancied the idea of being a songwriter for other people. And then my obsession really was about making records. Like when I was a kid, like hearing records in my room on my headphones, I was just like, that's that magical world. I was never really um, an artist in the sense, well, I was for a while, but I wasn't really committed to that whole touring and you know, being a rock star thing. I just love the studio. I love making records and writing music, you know. Did you, back in the day, I mean, I remember I used to sit and look at the album covers and look at the writers' names and the producers, and I'd learn all the lyrics. But I don't know if people can really get to do that, the, you know, people looking on Spotify now. I know they've started adding some credits, but there's not a lot of info yeah. about that stuff. It's getting better, but there's also there's a lot lost, isn't there? Like sometimes you'll go to an old record and you'll go into the credits and there's nothing on it. Or, you know. Oh, that that's actually very true. So, mm -hmm. but do you do you think if you if you could rewind now and look back to where you are, like look back on your journey and then now look forwards from when you were you know a kid, do you think you would have seen yourself where you are now? Has it kind of kind of all panned out the way you wanted it to? I don't. I mean, it's. it's... <sighs> I don't know if you get to a destination, do you? You're always kind of just on the train, like, and I'm always, I mean, my thing, the thing that keeps exciting for me is not knowing what's going to happen next. So I don't really want to think about that. You know, I, I, you know, I, it's like what's exciting is the next thing that comes up. And, and you know, the last few years has been really interesting for me because since I did Sing Street, it opened a whole load of other avenues that I did, I was, I was a, exec music producer on an Amazon TV show and I've been doing a thing on Broadway and and it's but you know for years before that I was doing pop production and writing. I think for and me I, what, what point, I've realised Gary is is the fact that it's basically the music business is like a game of snakes and ladders and that and that's what it is and I, I think at certain moments you're in one position doing something and then all of a sudden sudden other doors will just open and new avenues will become available. David, were you were you in bands by any chance or not really? Did you never do that? Uh, well, I think, you know, I had this conversation once with, with Billy Bragg about um, being in a band. Uh, and he said something very sobering, which is, it's a, it's a, it's a really great point when, in your life when you can come to terms with the fact that you're never going to be able to say thank you, Wembley, good night. You know, there's something, there's something quite edifying about you know realizing where your strengths are and i think everyone when you're a teenager you know you've got dreams of being on a stage and playing music and doing all that kind of thing because you know that's what that's what got me excited well listening to the radio got me excited with music and being at school with brilliant music teachers got me excited and included um but you know for me uh i i guess i mean i've done a lot of different things and i i hate the idea of doing something again that's the same, you know. I mean, I've done I've done a few concerts even, 
And I remember doing the second night, you know, it's with an orchestra, so you don't get to do it very often because it's hugely expensive. Um, but I was doing the second night and I thought, why am I doing this again? We've already done this. I know it's a different crowd, but, but I've done this already and I can't imagine what it's like touring and having to do the same thing night after night after night. Because even after one night, I was going through one song and thinking about something else that was going to be happening the next day. It was like really quite odd. You know, I mean, but Gary, you know, Gary has the advantage, I suppose, of having been a successful artist in his own right. And he's a great singer as well, you know. And I think one of the great, one of the great things about great writers a lot of the time is that if you understand the voice, if you understand how singing works and, you know, the language that works in a lyric, how, how the sound of a word that comes out of your mouth can, you know, can marry with, with the right note and, and, you know, it can kill it or it can make it come alive. And, and you know, I'm, I mean, I love, I, 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 you know, I know it's because he's here, but I think Gary is like a, a sort of master of songwriting and 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 i think that um i think i've had a lot of thought about this and i think that songs are the greatest of all art forms uh, and i'm sorry to everyone who's an artist or a poet or a novelist or whatever it is but i think there's something about the immediacy and the intimacy of a song and the accessibility of a song you know that you can you know gary just said that he was in his bedroom listening to it you know you don't have to go out to listen to a song you don't have to be anywhere was you don't even have to pay for it david was yeah. it beethoven who said that music has the ability to transport the listener into the heart and the mind of the creator i think it was something like that around those words well which are, there's, yeah there's a few phrases yeah there's a few phrases which people said to me my favorite one which may be attributed to him uh, and may not be but um it's like if it doesn't come from the heart it doesn't go to the heart um, you know, so there's an honesty, there's an honesty in, in writing, you know, stuff that really matters and the stuff that really works. But um, all, I, all I knew when I was young and starting was that I wanted to have something to do with the manufacturing of the noise that made me feel like that. You know, the sound of a record and the feeling that you get when you listen to a record mm -hmm. or a song or being in an ensemble, you know, a group of people playing, whether it's a band or a choir or an orchestra, um, could be anything. It's quite something about the, it's quite the electrifying nature of that. It's quite interesting when you think about concerts and bands. I mean, I, I started out touring, obviously, with a, with a band and was very blessed to have toured with bands like the Bee Gees and everything. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a really fun chapter in my life. But for the, in the end, it just turned into another hotel room. And I knew for me then that I, it wasn't what I really wanted to do. I wanted to go behind the scenes and become a songwriter as well. But I think that... Um, it's, there are so many different ways and I think it's quite surprising because everybody seems to want to be an artist nowadays. It's not so normal, I guess, to quote any other word, to use one, that, w that there are people that just solely want to be the music creators behind the scenes. Um, it's not, I don't think, as popular a, a thing, but I, I, I can thoroughly recommend it to anyone who's listening. <laughs> Olga, were you, were you the same? Have you always wanted to be behind the scenes or were you kind of wanting to be out the front in bands, rocking it up? I definitely, I was in bands when I was sort of at high school. That no. was my route in as well. So I wanted to be a drummer in, the, in a punk band. That was my kind of plan A for my career. Um, so not out front, um, but definitely being a rock star was kind of plan A, but probably about, um, I don't know, age 17 or 18, I probably got that uh, Billy Bragg moment of realising that it wasn't going to happen um, and that actually sound engineering looked a lot more fun and interesting. So you didn't actually, that's interesting because nearly all the drummers I know may decide to step into actually being producers, but you didn't, you didn't think, oh, I'll be a producer. No, it was more the engineering side of it. I mean, I've done some producing as well, but my kind of bread and butter is really engineering um, pointing microphones at people and things and making records and films, film soundtracks. It's fan yeah, don't forget, like, <laughs> Olga, Olga, Olga is, is a demon on a recorder. <laughs> I, I can imagine. She I, actually, she actually played for, I, don't, I don't know if you remember the uh, uh, Little Britain sketch, there was the Scottish hotelier, uh, <laughs> you know, who kept riddling people, you know, he jumped in and saying like, you know, you know, I am, I am jam, I am strawberry, what am I? Oh yeah. <laughs> You know him. Anyway, and then he used to do this little thing with the flute. Anyway, all that was older when I when I was doing the show, and then she did all the live stuff for the live. It was only took about half an hour, but no, she can play. You know, I mean, that's, that's the great thing about. That's my point you know. of my playing career. That was a highlight. 
but a lot of, a lot of great engineers come from a performance or a music background you know i mean certainly the ones that would come up to air um you know and they really are you know the best um uh, i'm surprised how great they are as as, as musicians uh, as well so to have that understanding of, of uh, you know the mechanics of how it works and also how it feels is really important it is. I think to me, I mean, only over the last four years have I actually started to get into doing vocal productions um, purely just because I wanted to be able to... I was working with Curly, the artist, and she was doing all her own vocals and doing effects. And I was so impressed. I thought, I, I, I want to learn how to do that. So I was really late to the party. But I don't think there are... Although there are a few more now, there aren't as many ladies doing it really, are there? Um, have you, did you find that in your, like your favour or goes against, really? Um, definitely at the beginning, when I first started at AIR, I was probably the only, uh, certainly the only female assistant that I knew of that was working in London at the time. Um, and actually, in a way, it was in my favour, I think, because clients kind of remember you. Like when you go into a big recording studio like AIR or Abbey Road, pretty much every other assistant engineer has got brown hair and glasses and is called Chris or John or something. So being a bit different, it kind of helped, I think. Um, obviously, then a bit later on, at this point in my career, Oh, I've myself. Oh. Um, yeah, I'm just saying at this point in my career, sort of. Oh, our sound engineer accidentally muting something. I know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you doing different. your own sound over there. I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> when I was just saying that, like, at this point in my career, when you're a bit older and you've got a family, I think then as a woman, you suddenly find that it's a bit harder because people expect you to put your career second when you have kids and to take a step back. There's definitely that expectation on women more than there is on men. Mm. Um, so I've definitely noticed that. I think I don't think it sort of set me back, but I've definitely had to fight against it. Yeah, I mean, I I, <clears throat> I just find as I'm getting a little older that um, I don't know if I've got the energy to stay up or the want to stay up till four o'clock in the morning doing sessions anymore. That's that's my biggest one. I don't think I don't know. Well, I think I, I, I can't do it. I have to. Will you? Will you guys still work till very late? If we have to, if I have to, but I'm definitely not a fan of the late, late session. Gary? Well, if, you've got, if you've got kids, you're going to be up at six in the morning, whatever happens. So, you know, it's best, best not to do that. But, but I, I, I found that most, I discovered a few years ago that everything I did past 10 p.m. generally got rewritten the next day. So I find that that's kind of like a bit of a cut off. Um, you know, it's like you get tired, your judgment goes, your ears start going. And not only that, but you've done a lot during that day. And I found that I, found, I come across a couple of composers and writers, actually, who when you're having to do it with deadline stuff, when you're having a complete sort of two or three minutes a day of finished music and you can't put it off till the next day because the next day you've got another two or three minutes. Um, is that like actually having a 20 minute nap? It's amazing how your brain will take care of some things for you. You know, sometimes when you wake up in the morning, you go, oh, God, why didn't what? Why did I think that was any good yesterday at, at half past 11 at night? Of course, I know that needs to change and that needs to be like that. Completely different perspective on it. So, you know, you can trust your brain to do some of that work. But, you know, I wish it did all of it without me having to do anything else. But, um, you know, having, having, having rest is, is really super important. And also you realise that it's OK to say that's it for the day. You know, it is OK. And regardless of the pressures of people doing it, it's amazing the power of no you know, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that in that time frame because I think it, you know, think the work will suffer. Because, you know, a lot of the time the expectation is like, well, we want you to do this by then and that's when it's got to happen. And as sort of musicians and composers, you know, we are kind of oddly programmed to want to serve that, yeah. um, to that demand, you know. And, and, and actually what, you know, the great thing about making records is if it's not, it's not ready until it's ready. And when it's ready, it's ready. And if, and if you said to Adele, this needs to be finished in two weeks time, you know, I'm not sure that that would really benefit anyone other than, you know, people who want to get the record on phone. I know in the pop industry, we've got into this real habit of churning out like the song a day. It's been like that for a while, hasn't it, Gary? You know, someone comes in, I know you, I mean, obviously I've worked with Gary quite a bit, so I know how he works, but it literally with a lot of people, it's in, right cut it done finished even when you've got the artist in the room and, and maybe a few production bits afterwards but i'm not quite sure why we've got into this now 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 mode as opposed to taking our time and 
and actually really thinking about things. I heard, well, I read an article the other day that Max Martin apparently likes to spend five weeks on a song sometimes. And I think that probably shows in, you know, the fact that he's having these huge hits because he is actually taking a little bit longer on them. Do you, Gary, how are you Leonard Cohen famously, um, Leonard Cohen famously said that he can take up to two years to write a song. Oh, yeah. And I totally get that because you can keep tweaking it forever, you know. Um, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to both, you know. Like when I did Sing Street, we had to do that so quickly. It was unbelievable. And, and there's an energy that's captured because of that, which sort of suits the, um, the, the idea that it's this young band and it's not all perfect, you know. But um, I'm also, as you know, V, working together, I, I, I find that one day thing too restrictive. Like, yeah. I, I think a song's ready, as, as David says, a, a song's ready when it's ready. I mean, actually, are they, are they ever totally ready? Like, there's just a time. I know, I remember you saying this, because of you <laughs> telling me, Gary, there was a point where you have to say, enough, Gary Clark. Enough, no yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, but you never, <laughs> that's perfect. But you can, you can go, oh, that's it, I can't get it. There is like this saying amongst engineers that says the mix is never finished, it's just abandoned. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, that's exactly right. Do you, Olga, when you're working on something, do you think now it's giving you kind of like really good, a, almost like A&R ears? You've, um, where you can actually, you can tell if a song's good that you're working on and things. I think so, but I don't know that I would say that I've got a and ears. I feel like I've been really privileged to work with amazing artists so that the stuff that they come to me with is generally of a really, really high standard. So it's not that I'm having to weed through a bunch of stuff and see potential in things that are in really early stages. I feel like I'm in a sort of privileged position of seeing stuff when it's already quite far along in the process. Because I think for a lot of our, our listeners and viewers watching, I mean, it's, that's one thing that's always a tricky thing to learn is how to critique your own music and to know when to actually go, okay, this one isn't quite working out or I need to rewrite this section. And, I, and, I, and it is obviously, it's a different skill set to learn that. Have you ever been in with bands and actually you've been mid-recording and they've suddenly gone, we need to change this? Has that ever happened? Yeah, quite a lot of the time. Um, and if I'm producing a record for a band, I'll go into rehearsals and pre-production um, and we'll do things like go through the structure, maybe change structures or um, drive ourselves crazy playing stuff at different tempos. So I do quite a bit of that. Um, and I also find for doing that kind of work, it's sometimes easier to take stuff away, even if it's just like a crappy phone recording and then take it home and speed it up or slow it down when you're away from the band and sort of people's feelings and how they feel about it. You, you're better off being away from it. You can be a bit more neutral. And I love that. What, what, when you're speeding up and slowing them down, what kind of, what is it changing, do you think, in your, your opinion? The mood of the song? Is yeah, that's how it makes you feel, really. I think, I think that's kind of the most important part of a song, isn't it? How it makes you feel. So yeah. it's just, you know, changing the BPM by a couple of BPM makes you feel more excited or, do you know what I mean? If it actually speaks yeah. to you more at a different tempo or by cutting out a section, that's, that's the kind of thing that I sometimes get involved in. That's something that we do quite a lot in the studio is, is literally just one or two BPM up or down just to make sure that the lyrics sit really comfortably in the pocket. If they, if they sound rushed, you know, you can just make that little change and it really will have a lot of, um, you know, difference on the song. Um, yeah. like you can find you like you go oh I've pushed it too far and then you know that you were actually right the first time Gary what were you going to say I was just saying keys are huge like that as well uh, especially in songs with singers you can find that you can move a, a, a semitone up or a semitone down and it just sounds like a completely different song you know yeah. it'll sound good in those other keys but you'll just hit one and you just go Ooh. I'd also I'd also like to think that a well-written song you know, the lyric would stick to the melody regardless of the tempo, unless you go to extremes, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I think when you find that when you work with, you know, when you find a great lyric, that it will work at, at any speed, you know, and I think, and I think that's why I think I'm quite a fan of slightly old fashioned way of working in that I like to write the song first and then maybe discover the sound of the song after. And I know that's not the same, you know, in a way when you don't do that, you're kind of making a record and the song is a part of making a record, but just as a personal preference, you know, I like the idea that you could, you know, grab a guitar or a piano and actually sing the song to someone and not have to rely on some sidechain synth, 
you know, for it to come alive. But that's, that's where the record is different to the song. And I think you can have amazing records that aren't necessarily amazing songs. You know, and I think you can have an amazing song that can fail on record if it's not recorded that's properly. True. That's but the truth. But it's and always, you know, it's like a great script and a film, you know, it's, so you can have a great script and you can have a lousy film of a great script. I think a lot of the time, I think the songwriters get blamed when a song doesn't sound right. But I've actually come to believe now that sometimes it's bad production that's not actually supporting the song. And there's a great story of that with them. Um, I was telling this last week, so I won't say it too much now, but it's um, with this kiss, Faith, you know, Faith Hill, the song that was recorded five times. And, you know, it was one of the biggest country songs ever recorded now, but it was five demos they had to do of it to get to get that perfect version of it. So it is, maybe it is worth, when you've got that great song, maybe it's worth stripping back and coming back to that way of writing. I don't think that's that unusual, is it? To, you know, yeah. I mean, you say that it has five versions of it, but if you only ever heard one, then, you know, the root to that one being perfect, it doesn't really matter if it happened first time or you had to do it five or six times to get there. What's important is that you get there. And I suppose if they released five versions, you might think it's a bit odd. But in the process of making a record, if you have the song to start off with, then I don't think it's that unusual to have, you know, varying versions. You know, it's like, I don't know how many, anyone who, anyone who names files, you know, it's like you've got V1, V1, R2, oh, yeah. V3, V4, R1, locked, latched, you know, mastered. This one. New, no, new mastered, one, really final mastered, one. actual <laughs> mastered. <laughs> This one, no, this, this one, <laughs> the now one. No, I think, I think we actually do that as much thing now. The production thing you're touching on there, though, because what I find with production, because I do a bit of both, is that sometimes if a song doesn't get cut or whatever, and you know this V as well, sometimes a song will sit on the shelf for five years or something like that. But it's the production that's more likely to go out of date than the song. That's true. And, and what you find is like, so, you know, your publisher or whatever will say we're looking for something for this artist and you go oh what about that song that'd be good and you go back and listen to it and you're like geez that production sounds five years out of date because it was five years ago do you know what i mean and so and and yet people are so a and r particularly are so tuned into production now like they need the production to sound like this week all the time you know so i don't know what the solution to that is if it isn't just either stripping it right back or doing new versions every time you get to that place, which is kind of impractical because you're- Maybe it's, the a, it's a tail wagging the dog, isn't it? To a certain extent. I remember like listening to a Frank Zappa quote, and he was saying that if you think about the music industry in the seventies that was run by, you know, the, the kind of cliche cigar chomping, awesome. you know, you know, guys, the big guys who kind of ran the, ran the show, didn't know anything about music. He said the most amazing and creative records were put out in those days by those people because they didn't know how to make a record. They didn't know a good song from a bad song. They trusted the people who they were employing to give them the material and then they would attempt to sell it. Now it's like everyone who runs a record company will come in and say, I think that bass drum's a bit off or, you know, <laughs> should that be an oboe? You know. <laughs> so can I just tell you a quick story? I was in the studio, I'm not going to say with, someone the, the other day and well this is before lockdown and they were like hang on a minute and they got they were looking at their watch and I was like going what are you what are you looking oh I've just got to wait the length of a time that it would take for me to do this new bounce I went what do you mean that it would take for you he goes well he goes the A&R's just asked me for a change I've just renamed labeled the song I said have you made the change then he went oh no I've just relabeled it with the change and I'm going to send it back and he did and they wrote back this is brilliant you've nailed it well, there's always that, you know. But, um, <laughs> you didn't even change it. No, I know. I mean, I think everyone's got a story where, you know, where that can happen. And, and certainly, I remember once actually I was in a studio and we were talking about digital versus analog recording. And, and I had an A-B test, actually. It was Jeff Foster, who was, you know, just, they just got some new bit of kit. Like, he always gets new bits of kit and it always sounds amazing. He goes, he goes all right, I, you say that you prefer analog recording. Let's do a recording with both. And I'll play back and you have to tell me which one you like. And I honestly couldn't tell the difference. You know, there's a lot of time that, you know, they have this kind of confirmation bias thing. It's like you're listening to, a, there's, there's some great stuff online about people who are obsessed with a certain guitar amplifier. And someone has created a model pedal of that amplifier. And the guys couldn't tell the difference, even though they insisted that they 
could, you know. So you do have to really trust your ears and also not worry too much about that sort of thing. All that stuff does is get in the way of the important thing, which is A, the writing, B, the performance, C, the recording of that. You know, those are the things that only that, re that really only, uh, only matter. And everything else is all, you know, fluff. If it, you know, if you, like Damien Rice's record, we recorded on a little 16 track, a 16 track um, called Digital Porter Studio. And it never went anywhere else, you know, and nothing else was really used. And it was mixed on that as well, you know, like a sort of 400 pound bit of kit. Uh, and, and we tried a couple of versions of it with some more expensive stuff, you know, in a pot room uh, and it just wasn't the same it wasn't the same record you realize well that's it's home you know it's been realized entirely for what it is on that equipment so it's really a matter of like if you're doing a painting you really have to stand back at every stage and say is this all it needs is this actually finished is this what is this what it is you know because otherwise, you can, like Gary said you can go back and you can keep changing and tweaking and and I don't really know what you're doing if you're doing that you know it's, yeah, uh, yeah. Olga, do you, what are you, are you analog or digital or? Do digital, you... I mean, I love, you know, the last probably completely analog record I did was the C6 Steve back in about 2012, maybe something like that. Um, it was all recorded on tape and put through the desk at air using automation, which I don't know, uh, watched the automation since then. But it's just, again, like David says, it's about just getting the job done really. Um, and you know, yes, for some things, analog would sound really cool for that type of record. But ultimately, it's about, you know, getting the song out there or the score or whatever it is. And also these days, you know, the amount of work that you're expected to do in the time available is just much more practical to do it digitally. And There's to be some able great to plugins things. now around, aren't they? Let's be honest. Sorry, say again? There's some great plugins now to make our life, you know, like it's easier. Talking yeah, exactly. About, talking about it, studios, I was going to say, Oh, have you been there? Are you, where are you all kind of at the moment? Are you actually able to go to studios? Or, I mean, obviously it looks like Gary, you might have one at home, mm. but uh, how, what's happening in lockdown for you all right now? Olga, are you, are you working or you've got a place? Um, I'm about, hopefully I'm about to start working again. I mean, the past two months of just everything's canceled or postponed. Um, I've got a studio at home, but uh, right now nothing's really being recorded, but hopefully, um, that's about to change. Obviously, there's a government announcement um, and they keep coming out with a few new extra bits of detail of how this is all going to work, that they're slightly lifting the lockdown. Um, so hopefully the studios are now, I think, trying to work out how they can safely work and have perhaps smaller groups of musicians under social distancing. So hopefully um, that will start to open up a bit. That will last until a drink happens, I think. It's like one drink, two drink, three drink, <laughs> four drink hugs. <laughs> You know what I mean? Oh, this one's great. But no, social distancing in a studio. That's no different from the old fashioned way of recording though, was it really? Everybody had their own little kind of sections in the studio, didn't they? Back in the well, day. I suppose, I mean, it would have a huge impact on, on the performance, especially for orchestral recordings, you know, because if you're, oh, trying, yeah. to get, if you're trying to get a violin section, you know, and, and that sound comes from a certain area where people are sitting close to each other, A, you're not gonna be able to get hardly in one, you know, it'd be a very small orchestra, but just being able to hear, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're effectively nine feet away from, you know, or 12 feet away from the next violin player, you know, or the last violin player in your group and trying to make that blend as an ensemble is going to be very difficult. I mean, these are all things that, that, that will be overcome, you know, like musicians are incredibly good at, at, at kind of reattuning themselves to, to, to any kind of situation, but those are all sort of practical questions, but I mean, it pretty much has put the brakes on, everything you know there's sort of no film tv production really happening uh i mean some people will be able to do animated things you know because a lot of that stuff is in the computer and people can take those things home or access it from uh offline but you know for, for everyone who's, who's recording it doesn't stop the right affecting you then um david how's it affecting your life right now and your work um well the, the the things that I thought I was going to be doing, which was going to be some re recorded stuff, actually, you know, like a record stuff and, and writing for a, for a couple of artists, um, that's all called, well, basically on pause. So, and there's a couple of things like a concert, uh, a, a special sort of event thing next year, a big, a, a big event, which we don't even, we're not even sure whether or not it can happen, you know, because it's in a big sort of concert venue. Uh, and and uh, so it's, Everything's a little bit as, as as it is for everyone, like completely up in the air. 
but this is like the first time in about 25 years where I haven't had a deadline uh, and oddly I'm enjoying that aspect of it you know not have to have that thing constantly following you around no matter what you do your mind is half on the thing that you need to be doing so you never stop you never stop working in a way you know when you think about music you never really stop thinking about it you're doing other things I mean I'm still not thinking about I'm, I'm never not thinking about music even when I'm doing this you know it's like there's some part of your brain which right. is turning something over and you walk out and then something else will go ping I don't know so I mean I'm trying to write I'm still writing stuff um but it's like everyone else you know you're at home you know doing it on your laptops or your home studios and uh and and, and hopefully you know somewhere to find a home for it when when we emerge blinking at the end of all this stuff but I suppose know, that's the good thing about laptops really and computer systems now because I mean at least if we have got stuff that needed additional production or if we've got home studios we can cut some vocals and and do, we can still keep you know our hands working on it and we can obviously still write at home um I know that a lot of people are trying to do zoom sessions and things I, I've not really been loving that myself it feels very vibeless but have, have, have any of you guys, Gary, have you been doing that at all? Not this time, but um, I've had to do them in the past and I, like you, I don't like them. I, there's just a, there's a disconnect and that little time difference yeah. is possible to get the vibe. But... Gary, are you, are you working? What, what's kind of happening for you in lockdown? Well, I'm, I, I'm kind of lucky in that respect. I sort of got into the home studio thing years and years ago and um, I've got plenty to do. I was, I was, I was, in the middle of writing a musical, um, the musical Nanny McPhee with Emma Thompson. And, and then I basically put it on hold to go and do uh, Sing Street on Broadway. And I got really involved in that. And I would have been just getting back from that. Now that would have been on stage by now, which of course it isn't. But when I came back, I was like, okay, I can get right back in and finish Nanny McPhee. So that's what I've been doing. Well, we actually did, we did a Sing Street live stream thing, which I was very involved in. And that was like, a Zoom thing where all the cast were playing live, and that was technically a, a, a nightmare. That took us ages to figure out how to do it, but we we did it, and it went quite well. But but now I'm just I'm working on Nanny McPhee and doing the demos here. So, do you think do you think it'll take us a while to catch up? Like once you know, because obviously we can't. I don't think we can really be booking things in just yet, can we? Because we really don't know. Well, like theatre theater is obviously the last thing that's going to be able to come back anything theater and, li and yeah. li big live events that's going to be the, the hardest hit because that, that's not going to be able to come back as quickly as studios and stuff um so but, but you can't really think about that you've just got to keep creating and keep creative and be ready for the, the next i think it kind of gives us time though to be able to look at other things so 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 mm -hmm. say like david had films in now maybe he can do some artist things for a bit, David. Is that right? Do you think? Well, I mean, I do that anyway. You know, it's like I mean, I haven't done films for a long time. I've done, I've done, okay. like in twenty in twenty twelve when we did the Olympics, and there was um, a sort of an eighteen month period where I couldn't do anything apart from the Olympics. And Olga was very heavily, you know, involved in that, as was pretty much every engineer I think in London. But but we had a great we had a great few sessions where actually where we were recording. Olga was engineering and and Fiona. Cruikshank was assisting, you know, like people coming into a room where your chief engineer and your assistant engineer are both women, uh, you know, which is like brilliant. And you think like, well, why isn't there more of that for a start? And I know Olga's doing like a ton of stuff outside of music to try and, you know, to try and uh, uh, address those issues. Uh, as in the Ivers, by the way, in the Ivers Academy, we've got a new diversity group, which I sit on the committee for. for. We're, we're looking into that as well, because I think it was only 4% of the recorded music charting was by women. So we're, we're, we're looking into that demographic and trying to maybe do some stuff like some women's writing camps and things like that to encourage yeah. it. You have to, you have to kind of do it across all, uh, uh, all areas, you know, um, and, and diversity is the thing that makes everything so wonderful. Um, you know, so it's ridiculous to, 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 to put, you know, barriers up to that happening. Um, but so, you know, so then I got into weirdly out of the, out of the Olympics and I did, I did a musical as well, which I absolutely loved. And I think the reason why I loved it was because as a media composer, you tend to do everything on your own. You know, you're on your own 90% of the time. And all of a sudden you're in a room with, you know, 40 people, a cast and, and producers and choreographers. And 
Which you know, which was that one? Dave? That's called Made in Dagenham. Which I I I love that by the way. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. Anyway, I love I love doing it, and and the cast were incredible. Um, and the greatest thing I liked about it was again like, like just being amongst carbon-based human beings. You know, you'd go in, there'd be a room full of people and you felt a real affinity with the cast and you realise that the things that you want to be putting into their mouths, they're going to have to be doing eight times a week. You know, so you're very sensitive to actually the things that you're asking people to do. And, I'm and, laughing, and sorry, I'm laughing thinking back to your other comment about the gig not repeating it the second night. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's why I'm kind of in awe of, of performers who have to bring that, you know, to... I mean, I saw Wicked. Before lockdown, uh, I saw Wicked. I'd never seen Wicked. And I think that show had been running for 17 years. Yeah. Uh, and I kept thinking about, good Lord, you know, it's like to be doing that show eight times a week, not that it's the same cast, but probably by the time you get to see it, they'll have done it a few hundred times. Uh, and I think every night they've got to bring it like it's the first time. And it's just an extraordinary effort they have to make, physical and emotional effort. So I'm hugely appreciative of it. Of, 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 of all of their skills and it makes you more aware when you're writing about what you're asking people to do and anyway so it went from that to Dagenham to then Sherlock kind of went berserk uh, and then all the other things sort of like the big sort of TV things but I mean I've always liked writing um, I've always liked working with artists and making songs I mean I was lucky I was doing my first uh, experience with Gary actually was with David McCalmon on a record. Oh, I remember a long, that. that I remember. A long time ago, but he, they, they bought this song in, which was just extraordinary. You know, it was like, I just thought it was like something Burt Backrack had written. Uh, mm. and, and David told me that Gary had done it. And, and I mean, it was just a beautiful song. Um, and, you know, it, it felt like it needed a sort of timeless feel. So it's just like strings and it's very gentle. Um, but it was just a, a brilliant song. And then, you know, it makes, it makes you realise that, you know, there is a huge difference between songwriters and people who assemble songs. You know, it's like, in a way, technology has allowed, and I think the democratisation of this is brilliant because there have been amazing work done by people who may not traditionally have been musicians necessarily, you know, or trained or understand it, it doesn't matter, come up with brilliant work, and I love all that. Um, but, you know, it's like when, when, you know, when you grow up listening to sort of great songs, you know, sort of written songs that are songs that are written, I'd say, vertically rather than horizontally. You know, if you start with a click, the click will dictate to you what you do next. But if you sit at an instrument and try and play, you tend to write to the color and the shape and the size of the thing as it moves through, you know, and you respond to it in a different way. And I know that that's a different way of working from making a track and top line in it. I know that's different. Yes, yes, uh, yes. And I think there's been plenty of great songs that have been created like that. I prefer the, 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 other, the other thing. And I think, you know, Gary's like no, a master no, but there's, that. there's something that you said that I'd love to um, repeat. You, you said something about thinking about that song that's going to be going on forever and or sung numerous times. And I think perhaps maybe we forget that thought when we're writing now, that will this, this song actually stand the test of the time? Can it be repeated? I, I'm, and, and I'm actually going to take that one away from myself today because I think that's a really good point. But well, you... I'm, not, I'm not sure that it's that important, you know, because what happens to it once it leaves you is completely out of your control. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done films and songs that I think have been great that have done nothing. That's and, you know, truth. maybe, maybe <laughs> they'll have a life somewhere else, I don't know. And I've had some that have been successful that I didn't think necessarily would be. I mean, all your responsibility is you do what you do in the day, in the time that you have. That's the only thing you have control over. What do you do? today uh, and if you apply yourself to what you're doing in the best way that you can then you can shut the door at night and think well I've, I've done the best thing. what happens to it now what can I do about it you know I mean you can't force people to like something they're either going to like something or they don't like something but the important thing is that a you like it and b that you've enjoyed the process of making it otherwise why would you fill your life with misery and do something that you don't like it's not, it's not enough that we just like them as well. I've learned that lesson. Gary, Gary, Paranoid, that song. Oh, yeah. that, was, that was one of my ones that was just like, why has no one taken this song? But well, we did get a cut, didn't we? But then yeah. it was released. And it's yeah, like, did it. <laughs> just, people did it. The song genre. never quite made it. Gary, yeah. do you like, um, are you like kind of enjoying like the time on your own to work or are you missing that camaraderie of, of um, co-writers and people around? Um, 
Well, just David was reminding me there what was kind of interesting recently working on the theater thing is that instead of it being a room of two or three people or four or five people, it's a room of 50 people, you know. Whoa. And that was really extraordinary experience. It really was. And it made me, and it's actually fueled me coming back into this other musical. Because now I sort of understand a bit more the mechanics of it and, you know, the energy that's going, that goes into that, you know. But in terms of writing um, songs and recording and stuff, I've recently, the stuff I've been doing has brought me a lot back more into a solitary situation. And I've actually been really enjoying it. That's kind of the way I started out, just writing songs on my own. There's not, I mean, I, I, it's not a hard or fast rule. I love collaborating as well. But, but there's something about that old school thing of writing a song from the ground up and at a piano or at a guitar. I mean, even at a computer, but the, um, there's something about that. I really enjoy the, jug, the jigsaw puzzle element of it, you know? I enjoy when you put the last piece in and you go, that's it, you know? Yeah, it is. there's not no greater feeling than when you've got the song done and it's all sounding great how you want it to be. Olga, do you ever, I was gonna say, like when you're part of this, do you still part of the, feel part of the process even when you're recording? Um, for the fact that you haven't been like maybe a creator on the song, do you do you feel still feel that close as like, well, this is my baby too? Yeah, definitely, because I think you do have quite a lot of influence, even if the song is completely finished and you're not making any sort of changes to tempos or structures. You know, you're still responsible for how it sounds. Um, and quite often, either as an engineer or producer, you'll get into the performance side of it as well. Um, and you know, help people get you know get the best performance out of people. So yeah, it definitely certainly things where I've worked on them from start to finish. So from recording to mixing, I definitely feel a, a sense of you know this is my baby as well, and a sense of ownership, and I guess being a bit protective over something as well. I like I like that. Would you? Is there any kind of advice that you'd give to anyone listening to this who's looking to maybe follow in your shoes and pursue this, like especially as a woman, uh, as a woman, you know? I think don't don't feel that it's not for you because I think even in the sort of 15 years, I guess, since I've been in the industry, there's been so many more women now that have come through. So some of the women that assisted me when I was first starting engineering are now producing records themselves. So I think women are not really an anomaly as much anymore. We're still in the minority, but it's not weird to have a woman in the studio. So absolutely, if, if you feel like if it interests you and it excites you, then go for it. What I, what I think is weird is, it's just as we're talking about this, is if I look back to when I first started, it wouldn't even have been an option, I don't think, for me. I don't think it would have crossed my mind that I could have done this as a job. It, it just wasn't, women weren't doing it, really. It's, 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 it's good to see that the change is coming into play now. It is happening, slowly, but it's happening. You know, not that we should be, you know, equal for men as well. Everyone should be happy. <laughs> I, mean, part, I mean, part of it is just the perception of the job, you know, it's uh, because, you know, a lot of the time there aren't many women in studios because there aren't many women who, who, who take it up, you know, and it's like, it's, it's making people aware of the possibilities of doing the job as a job, you know, this is what it is. And if you're a musician, you know, who's interested in that, then it's the same with music or performance, you know, I mean, if you're a brilliant musician, then I think people don't really, care that much if you're a man or a woman some people were, you know would care if it was a, a, a female or a male doing doing certain jobs but you know shut your eyes then you, can, you know you can't you can't ever tell can you but um yeah. I think you, just need to, you need to let more people uh be i think that is happening as well you know people are aware that um that, you know that all these things are attainable and doable um and you know if you're good at it people will know about it pretty quickly I think also there's also different routes in now, I think. It's not just sort of making tea in a big studio and working your way up for 10 years. Uh, now, because a lot of people are producing, maybe in their bedrooms or home studios, you can work for one producer and go that route as well. So it's not all the sort of really traditional kind of quite um, long route that I took. There's different routes in now as well. David, there was one question and that I did want to ask you actually. Um, you know, when you're composing, and actually, Gary, because you, you, you're doing this as well now, um, on the in more instrumental side, when you're, when you're working without a vocal, do you kind of pick one instrument that's almost like a vocal line? Is that how you do it when you're writing? Well, 
I mean, the thing with, with film and TV writing is that you are writing, whether you like it or not, on your own, but as a team. So you have to be very aware about what you're looking at. And you have to be very aware of the other things that are going on. I mean, if you're writing for a scene where people are talking, then you have to try and avoid the frequencies that the vocal sits in. You know, So if you have a flute solo or a clarinet solo over someone talking, then they're going to clash. You know, the reason why strings work so well, you know, because you've got very high registers, very low registers, and they tend to be out of the way of, of dialogue frequencies. Um, you know, you've got to be aware of the sound that's happening in the place that you're writing for. So you can think in your mind about how you would like to realize this thing musically, but when you try and apply it to the picture, when you try and apply it to the, to the, to the piece of storytelling that it has to live with, um, then you have to be very aware of everything else that's, that's going on. You know, in, in, in musical theatre, um, you can trick things with, you know, obviously the venue's going to sound different and with the, if someone you know, sings or speaks a bit louder at a certain time, there's live stuff that can happen. Obviously, it's different every night. Sometimes the players might be fractionally louder, you know, on a Friday evening, you know, or Saturday, you know, Saturday after, um, after the matinee. Um, you know, but those things can be dealt with. With a film, it's fixed, you know, so, um, so you have to be very aware of everything else that's going on. At the start of the process, when you're conceiving what the music is, and if it is a music-driven thing rather than, you know, sort of partially sound or a, a sort of atmospheric kind of approach, um, then that's where I always hear the music sort of complete. The frustration is then getting it out of your head and into the world so other people can hear the same thing. Um, but when I hear it, I hear it complete. So, you know, whatever that is, a, so a solo trumpet or violin section or, you know, whatever it is you decide to do, I, I, I hear it. You can always change it, obviously, but I, I hear that first. Um, but with film and TV, it's like I said, everything has to sit with a lot of other things as well. So it's not just a matter of you. This is going to be this, you know, a saxophone solo playing, you know, full thrust when someone's having a conversation or something. Musically, it might make sense, but you have to, you know, it's a team sport and you have to live alongside all the other things as well. But technically, for someone who's in lockdown and if they're a songwriter, they could potentially have a go at changing their vocal melodies to an instrument and trying to maybe trying their hand at some media stuff potentially. Well, a good, a good, a good tune is a good tune, whether it's sung or played, you know, I mean, I'd say the first thing is write a good tune, you know, and then the, 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 you know, it's like, don't put the cart before the horse, you know, it's like, who was it, who was it you said, who was it, was it, was it Randy Newman or it might've been, um, it might've been Frank Zappa, it might be, anyway, I'm going to be, slaughtered for not knowing but I think there is a track it might be Frank Zappa where it says you've got an amazing drum track we've got the most amazing bass line we've got a great guitar part if only we had a song you know that's why I always like putting the song first and then finding out what you know bolts I think that's Neil Young isn't it was it okay we don't have a, a vocal. someone would know better than I would. the only thing with Frank Zappa that came into my mind was Catholic Girls which is probably not very appropriate for today <laughs> That was the only song that came into my head. I remember listening to that album years ago. Wasn't it well, the guy that transcribed all the guitars, wasn't it? Is that right? I have no idea. No yeah, idea. Weird. What a job that would be, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what, that was his challenge, I think. Frank said to him, if you can do it, I'll, I'll speak to you. So he did. <laughs> So Gary, what's the what's the next plan for you then? So coming out of lockdown, what are you gonna what where's your focus going to be on? Um, well, I'm hoping we can get back to where we pick up where we left off on Sing Street, because we were literally it was the first day in the theatre, first time we had the band through the big system, and there was you know, it went from being fifty people in rehearsals to like being a hundred people. There's people that there's a teams of people that do lights and stuff, and it was just it was, we were just we've just got the show ready to roll. So I'd have to get back to that and sort of re-remind the band how everything needs to be played and then, uh, you know, hopefully get that on the road. When, when you're writing for different projects, Gary, do you immediately know, I mean, this is more for people listening to my, my question, but do you immediately know which direction you should take things at? So say like the Nanny McVie musical that you're working on, when you're dealing with songs like that, how would you know how to deal with the production, the style? Well, that's an interesting, that particular one's interesting because it's, when they first asked me to do it, one of the producers had seen the film Sing Street and 
thought that I would be right for it. But when they asked me to do it, I was like, it's such a weird gothic fairy tale kind of thing. I was like, what does that music sound like? And then I went and met Emma and we just went for a walk up in the hills in Scotland and started talking about it. And a lot of what she was saying was the same that I'd been thinking. And it was this kind of almost Victoriana gothic pop kind of thing. And, and I don't know, it just sort of, um, and then she sent me some lyrics and I, and I did a, a couple of songs and we kind of found the rhythm and the vibe of it quite quickly. The thing for me now is there's so many songs in a musical that it's keeping it fresh, like, and still staying inside the language. That's what's been the hardest thing about. Um, so it's almost like making a huge album, basically. That one is. Sing Street was uh, different and there's not quite as many songs and there are some original, there are some 80s songs in it. There's like, you just can't get enough from Depeche Mode and stuff. And then there's, I think, nine or 10 original songs. Um, uh, but I mean, that, that was a gift in the sense that it's all set in the 80s is exactly when I would have been first learning how to write songs and make music. And there was a really strong um, plot and reasons for songs to exist because it was a bit of school band and like what they were saying. So, you know, rebellious songs and creative songs and love songs. And there was all, there was real, uh, the emotion was kind of written in the script and so um, and the time zone was written in the script. So. Is there a little piece of you in there do you think from your childhood? Oh huge huge amounts. So, uh, Sing Street was and John Carney as well the, who I wrote a lot of the music with. John um, the film director I mean he's a great musician like he was in bands like he was in the, the, the frames and stuff and he he um, he based the whole thing actually on his, there's pictures of him in his school band and it looks exactly like Sing Street, you know, it's, it's mind blowing. But, but, the, but the, he, he would literally say to me, I need a song, it needs to be uplifting and I'll think about like Hollow Notes and Huey Lewis in the news, you know. Like that, that look that, you know, like so it's a gift, you like go into that zone for a couple of days. And, I, I must say the Nanny McVie one, that, that style combo interests me greatly. I, I'm, I, I can't wait to hear that, Gary. You'll have to well, keep... I mean, that, that's great as well, because like, where, where else would you get a chance to write a song called Is It Wrong to Eat a Baby? You know? <laughs> <laughs> a second delay. David, what? Yes. <laughs> David, you must have bad, bad some weird titles. I know. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, mean, it, it's, I love that Good Omen fairy tale. You know that I've told you that before. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, that. No, well, the thing about it's interesting with with musicals is that you know it's like the the, the saying is you know music musicals are, are are written to be rewritten. You know, and there's never a point. I mean, what's great about putting them on a stage is that it's like when you play a song to someone for the first time, uh, you inherently get a feeling for what's working and what's not working. Um, and when you have an, what I found quite unusual with it, with a musical is that. On a Monday and Tuesday, you come out of the theatre thinking you've written the greatest show that ever existed. On a Wednesday and Thursday, you come out thinking that you've written the worst show that ever existed. Sometimes it just lands and sometimes it doesn't. It's quite odd. Um, but, you know, there's a, a great... You know the song, If I Ruled the World? Um, that Harry Seacombe had a big hit with it. If I ruled the world, every day would be the first day of spring. Anyway, it's a classic old song. Huge hit for him and, and for other artists. Um, it was written for a musical two days before opening because they felt that they needed a song. It was about, about an MP who was trying to get people to vote for him. And they felt that he needed a song. He didn't have a song. So they went away and they wrote this thing overnight and it went into rehearsal the next day. And it was the biggest, the only real big hit in the, in the entire show. So you never really know where that, you know, that thing's going to come. I remember talking um, uh, to uh, uh, Marcus Drabs about when he was uh, engineering, you know, he did some uh, amazing things. Um, and Mumford and Sons, you know, the song "I Will Wait" was 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 a request from the record company to write a single three days before delivery of the album. Do you know what I mean? It's like so. So you never really know when these things are gonna come up, and also your ability to know when something's a hit or not a hit, or something that's good or not good. You know, sometimes I find if you said to me, "Write me a song about," You never want to eat a baby, and I need it by tonight. I'd do it. I would do it, you know. And it's like, but if it was like, can you, 
you can, I'll you need it in six weeks' depend. time. It might I take six, six weeks to do it. <laughs> Although you can't because that title's been taken and Gary will sue you. <laughs> well, there's, yeah, there's obviously the, the uh, uh, you know, Book of Mormon's got a more uh, lascivious baby song in it, which we won't talk about here, but that's, uh, <laughs> that makes Gary's one sound almost biblical. In, it's uh, quite funny, actually. I used to say, I used to say, I'm not putting the word baby in a song. That was me. Okay. <laughs> my one is, my yes. one is Mummy and Daddy. I just... I can't stand mummy and daddies in songs personally. Right. So yeah, you've I now broken wonder. yours. I hope I don't get to, I don't want to break mine either. <laughs> Baby's not that bad. Is it? I like, yeah, I like, uh, what is it? Was it Rachel? Uh, you know, baby, ooh, ah, baby, I love you, call me. Yeah, baby. but back in the day, and baby love and all of that, but like, baby's fine, but mummy, Mummy, mummy loves you. Who, yeah, who, who's written that song? <laughs> Making titles up, they're horrible though. Pers that's my personal preference though. Right. <laughs> Olga, have you ever worked on any lyrics where you've gone like, oh, what are um, you saying? I've worked on lyrics that change a lot. Um, I know bands often when, you know, they'll change lyrics at the last minute. Um, you know, they'll have recorded the whole track and they might change the lyrics sort of the day before they send it off to mastering so I've definitely been on things like that. I think there are, I think it's never too late until it's actually done and finished and even then it's not too late to make changes is it really? That's the, that's the point here isn't it? It's, yeah it's, you can you can repurpose re anything you know it's like if you have, yeah if you have a great riff you know and it's in another I mean I've just written a song for a very famous artist and I think it's awful but there is loads of great bits in it. You know, it's like, it's almost like How it's sort of free. Because it just is, you know, it's like you need to know when something's not good. And, you know, you work on it for three or four days. You think, okay, this is the song. And I sit back and I listen to it and go, actually, it's really not, it's really no good. And I'm just going to start again. Because I think it'd be better if I just started again, just rub it out completely. But it's got three or four great little ideas in it that could themselves turn up somewhere else. I don't know. But, you know, you have to be really fiercely critical with what you're doing because, you know, if you think that everything you do is great, you know, no matter how much time you spend on it, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're fooling yourself. You know, you've, you've got to be your own worst critic. Um, and I do find actually for, for people writing songs that playing them to someone really makes you feel, I mean, it used to be that you'd go out and, and perform it and then an audience would let you know if they liked it or not. Uh, but now you can just, you know, send a few people in the same room, be in the same room when they're listening to it, rather than say, tell me what you think, because you're never going to get, you know, truth uh, from that. But you can tell by people's body language and the way that they breathe and the way that they move and the way that you feel about it, you know, so I really feel like it felt like it needed to lift here. And yet I felt like it didn't when I'm playing it to someone. So we need to do something about that section. No, that's it's very like true. having a relationship with the music and knowing when it's not working, you know, that's and also so knowing when to divorce no. it. You can, that's so true, David. I've had songs where you, they sound so amazing and vibey in the studio and then you sit in a clinical office of an A&R and suddenly the song is just like, that's <sighs> like, there's nothing worse than that feeling. Of course, none of you ever write songs like that. <laughs> they're all brilliant. I write plenty of them, but they're all in the bin. <laughs> they don't come out. Oh, well, listen, guys, we've reached our 12 cutoff point. But thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully everyone's taken a little piece away of this today to help them and inspire them. And just to let you know, next week, we've got a really special week. We, we're um, kind of joining in with the Mental Health Week. Um, so please join us and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Love you. See you. Bye. See ya.